Hello YC family, I'm excited for us to be together today. We're going to talk about knowing and, and trusting and yielding to God's will. And that's not always easy, especially when I don't know what God's will is. And you might be asking that kind of a question these days. What's God's will for me in the midst of COVID? What's God's will for me in, in the midst of all this social distancing? God has not been silent and I want us to discover a little bit more how to know God's will and how to do God's will. Scriptures make it absolutely clear. There are hundreds of passages about God's will, about how to know it and how to accomplish it. You and I, our life of blessing is dependent on our understanding and cooperation, indeed how we yield to God's will. If we choose not to yield to God's will, we will not experience blessing. We will experience curse. We will experience heartache. We will experience confusion. We will experience a lack of satisfaction. And conversely, if I know and do God's will, all those things will be what I do experience. Satisfaction, blessing, fulfillment, a peace of mind that I know that I am in sync with God. Are you in God's will? Let's talk about what that looks like. There are two kinds of uh, there are two aspects to God's will that we see in Scripture. Um, so let's just simply ask the question, what is God's will? Well, God's will is simply His plan and His purposes. In uh, Proverbs 19.21, it simply says, Many are the plans of a man's heart, so human will. Many are the plans or the human will part of a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purposes, God's will, that will prevail. He's saying that you and I, the will of man, we can have a lot of desires, a lot of patience, want to do things, but our, our will, our passion, our desires will not prevail. They will not last, but the will of God will last forever. And so God's purposes and his plans, he wants us to recognize that they are good for us. Uh, Jeremiah 29, 11, God says, for I know the plans I have for you, the will he has for us. It is good and not evil. It's for you to prosper and not to be harmed. Um, it's to give you a hope and a future. Well, your hope and your future, being one with, filled with blessing, filled with satisfaction, is dependent on whether or not you understand what God's plan and will is. So let's talk a little bit about God's plan and will. It comes in two different, two different avenues. There is the sovereign will of God. Um, and God's sovereignty is his, um, is his promised plan. God has a plan. Whenever you and I join, uh, join Christ in salvation, we are joining God's plan. Up to that point, you and I are working some distorted plan of man. It's going in an opposite direction from God's purposes. In 1 John chapter. Uh, 2 verse 15 it says do not love the world this is the plan of man do not love the world or anything in the world for everything in the world the cravings of sinful man the lust of his eyes and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the father but from the world but the man who does the will of God lives forever you see God's will is this purpose and plan of God that isn't temporary it's eternal it, it expands past, past our temporary experience on earth into eternity. And so whenever God says in, through Jesus in, in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, so that whoever believes in him shall have what? Eternal life. When we enter into a relationship with God, we are stepping into the sovereignty of God. His plan to redeem all things, to redeem all things. Uh, it's beautiful, the Apostle Paul, as he addresses uh, believers spread all over, all over Asia, um, whether it's in Corinth or Philippi or Ephesus or Colossae or Thessalonica, over and over, the first, within the first chapter of many of those letters, the Apostle Paul talks about the will of God. He talks about the sovereign will of God, which you think about a sovereignty. Um, when we think about a sovereignty these days, uh, it's not as it was in the time of Christ. A sovereign in the time of Christ would have been someone who would have been in charge. Caesar would have been a sovereign. He was the ultimate control of mankind. What Caesar said went. What Caesar wanted done got done. But even Caesar, 
and all the power he had, people could still maneuver themselves and, and maybe get away with it without Caesar knowing it. But the sovereignty of God is different than any sovereignty of any earthly king. Sovereign means all-powerful and supreme. All-powerful and supreme. And so the sovereignty of God is the ultimate power and the ultimate supremacy. Whereas Caesar couldn't see you, a king can't see you, Jesus does see you. <laughs> we just looked uh, last week with Pastor Jake at, at uh, the text and actually the, the passage that I shared two weeks ago that he said to the Pharisees, the problem is, is you want to justify yourselves in the eyes of men, um, but God sees the heart. The heart and the motivation of man cannot be hidden. God, our sovereign God, sees it. And God has a plan. He has a plan. And the craziest thing in the world is that he invites us into his plan. Look what it says in Galatians chapter 1, verse 3 and 3 through 3 and 4. It says, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, um, who gave himself, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us in accordance with the will of God the Father. Now that's important to see. Jesus gave himself to rescue us from our sin according to the will of the Father. God's sovereign will was for Christ to die. Now here's, here's the radical thing about God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty is not, is not limited by man's depravity, man's sinfulness. In fact, God used the sinfulness of man, of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and of Pilate and Herod and all those that collaborated for the crucifixion of Christ, God used all of their sinfulness to accomplish his righteousness. God's plan is never thwarted by human uh, depravity, sinfulness, waywardness, because God's sovereign plan is unstoppable. It's unstoppable. And primarily when we see his sovereignty in scripture, it's about the redemption of all things. The truth is Jesus promised to return. And when he returns, his sovereignty will be seen. His supremacy and majesty, majesty will be felt right down to the bone as every, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You see, his sovereign plan will bring everything to its knees. In Scripture, when it talks about the will of God, it's either talking about the sovereignty of God or the desired will of God. God's desired will, which are his commands. His promises are those things that are unequivocally going to happen because God stamped it as so. It's a decree that will take place. Jesus came as the Messiah to pay the price for sin and he will return to bring us to himself to a new heaven and new earth. Those things are sovereign. It's God's plan. Nothing can stop it. Now, the critical piece that we have to understand is, is that this sovereignty that God has, this sovereign will and plan that he invites us into, he invites us into redemption. Now, you and I have a choice on whether or not we enter into that plan. In 1 first, in first Timothy chapter um, 2, verse 3, it says, It is God's desire or God's will that all would come to salvation. Um, but that desired will is, is a part of his desired plan. He desires us to come to him, but we'll all repent. Um, in, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says something very similar. It says, God is patient with you, not wanting, this is God's will, other translation says God's will, God wanting that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Here's the question. Do all repent? No. Do all change their mind? No. So this piece of God's will is not a promise. He's not promising that, that all are going to repent because all have been given a free will. You see, there's always resistance to, 
my will to the will of God. There's always a resistance to that. And whenever it comes to God's desired will, it's he's inviting me to accept his plan, to cooperate with his plan, to trust his plan, to enter into his plan. Let me give you another passage that speaks about this. Thessalonians, clearly, he says, God's will for you is to be holy. Now listen to this second part. This is God's desired desire for you, his invitation to you, his command to you. Um, he wants you to be holy, set apart, so stay away from all sexual sin. <laughs> okay, so here's the question. Do, does everyone stay away from sexual sin? Well, clearly not. Well, do all Christians stay away from sexual sin? Uh, clearly not. It's not God's sovereign will. It's God's desired will. In Thessalonians, in, uh, it, in Thessalonians chapter 5, just move a couple, uh, another chapter over, it says, Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. Tough to do. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. What's he saying? God's desire for us is that we would be we engaged in prayerful connection with him all the time. God's desire for us is that we could give thanks in all things, in all circumstances. That's God's desire, is that we would rejoice in all things. But do we do that? No. Why? Because we have free will and we can choose to go away from God's plan and away from God's will. So, let's look at the birth story of Jesus. Over the next few weeks, we're going to do this. And as we do so, we're going to talk about aligning ourselves with God's will. How do we do that? Mary, Joseph, Zechariah, the, all the characters in the birth story either give us a cooperation with God's will or a dissonance to God's will. We're going to look at several of those over the next three weeks. Let's look at Mary and we'll dig into her story this week and a little more next week. Uh, in verse 26, we pick up the story uh, right after Elizabeth um, has been told um, that Zachariah, Elizabeth's husband, has been told, and Elizabeth's been told that they're going to give birth to John the Baptist. And this is this is an unlikely thing that would take place because Elizabeth and Zachariah are old. They are way beyond years to give birth. Picks, it picks it up in verse 26. In the sixth uh, month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. So, the unthinkable is happening. This old woman is pregnant. God sent an angel, Gabriel, to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Uh, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus. He will be great, and you will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Do you hear God's sovereign will in this? He's promising things that will happen unequivocally. Nothing can stop it. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and with power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. The NIV 84 says, for nothing with God is impossible. Okay, let's take a look at three things that, that needs to happen that Mary shows us by her response to God's revelation. Whenever God reveals something, it's what is he revealing? He's revealing his will, his either his sovereign will or his desired will. All of revelation, all of the scriptures, I got my Bible out here as well as my Bible app. All of the scriptures reveal God's either sovereign will or his desired will. If I don't know those, how can I how can I 
comply with them? How can I yield to a will that I do not know? Mary learned God's will. How? How did she learn God's will? From an angel. <laughs> I want an angel. I want an angel to tell me God's will. <laughs> I'm going to get to that point uh, if not in the sermon, then definitely in my devotions, because um, it's a little bit of a crack up. But I think a lot of us, we read this story and we think, oh gosh, I want an angel. I want an appearing of a divine being to tell me what to do. That ain't going to happen. That ain't going to happen. And I'll, if I don't touch base in the sermon, come back and join me in the devotions, because I want to tell you why that ain't going to happen. But God is going to show you his will. And God has most importantly showed us his will when i am in the word of god i know the will of god when i'm in the word of god i know the will of god mary was given something you and i don't have you and i have something mary didn't have when we have the word of god we know the will of god mary understood that the word of god was delivered to her by this angel and I want us to, to recognize three things about what Mary did that you and I need to do. The first one is awareness. I want you to just say that with me. Awareness. Uh, will you say it while you're watching? Awareness. I want you to say a second word. Acceptance. Say it. Acceptance. A third one. Obedience. Awareness. Acceptance. Obedience. These three, these three things are critical for us to be able to accomplish the will of God awareness to what the will of God is, acceptance to what the will of God is, and obedience to what the will of God is. Let's look at these in Mary's life and her response. The first one we see Mary, um, it, it says that Mary was tr greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. I want you to understand, number one in your notes, is, is the awareness piece only happens when you and I recognize that God's will is at times troubling. Number one in your notes, under point number, Roman number, number two, is we must, we must recognize that God's will at times is troubling. Not all times, but oftentimes, God's will is troubling. It's asking us to do something we don't want to do. It's asking us to do something we're uncomfortable doing. It's not going the direction we want to go. It's going maybe 180 degrees the other way. God's will is often troubling. It is. It's, it's discouraging. It's, it's frustrating. We just looked a little bit ago at uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.3. Remember what it said? It said, it is God's will for you to be holy. Let me read it to you exactly. He says, <clears throat> God's will is for you to be holy, so stay away from sexual sin. <laughs> well, from the person that is pretty committed to sexual sin, that's kind of troubling. Because why? Because they want to keep having sexual sin. <laughs> Whenever you and I are convicted because we're going a way that is counter to God's blessing, his purposes, his will, and he asks us to do an about face, to repent, to turn, it's going to be troubling. Mary was a virgin, but this information that came to her she wasn't guilty of sexual sin but she was she was guilty of still being a sinner she was really truly honestly um, no matter what you think about mary mary was a sinner she was just like you and i uh, she found favor with god but so have you and i when she when it says that she had f favor from god it means that she the grace of god was coming to her guess what the grace of god has come to us and it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to turn and live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. That's Thessalonians, that's Titus chapter 3, verse 11, verse 11 I believe, uh, off the top of my head. God calls us to turn. He calls us to recognize that, that in our willfulness and our will goes against God's will. And I've got to be aware that sometimes God's will for me is going to be troublesome. It says also in Scripture, in First, in First Peter, that it is God's will that we suffer for doing good, not for suffer for doing wrong, although we'll suffer for both. But at times, we will experience suffering, troublesome, but it's right in the middle of God's plan. 
When James tells us to consider it pure joy whenever we face trials, he's saying God's will for you is to embrace a difficulty that's troublesome. God wants you and I to recognize that awareness is critical for us to get a handle on what God's doing in our lives. Because here's what I need you to know. In your notes, trusting God, trusting God's will has nothing to do with your comfort. Trusting God's will has nothing to do with your comfort. God is less concerned about your comfort than he is your character. You see, what God's ultimate will for you is, his sovereign will, once you've said yes to Jesus, uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That's God's sovereign will. His will is to work in you to will and do according to his good pleasure. God is committed to change you, but he invites you into that desired will. He invites you into trusting him. He invites you into yielding. Jesus was the ultimate example of yielding to God's will when at the cross, at the garden, before the cross, when he prays to God, if there's any way for this cup to, to pass from me, any way I don't have to take this cup of suffering, Lord, please let it be, but not my will, your will be done. The first step in embracing and yielding and trusting the will of God is to be aware that it's troublesome is to be aware that it may go counter to our will and our desires and our inclination. Awareness, awareness, awareness. Are you aware of where you are right now and that what God may be asking you to do may go counter to your comfort? Because trusting God's will has nothing to do with your comfort. Number two, accepting God's will or responding to God's will and his plan with honesty is our second task. Our first task in awareness is, is recognizing that, that God's will might be troublesome. Awareness, that whenever we're going the wrong way and God asks us to turn around, that may be challenging. It may involve trials. It may involve suffering. It may involve not giving in to our comfort but it will lead to God's blessing. What I need you to know is that when we embrace God's desired will, when we obey his commands, it is the path, it's God's path to blessing. No other path will take you to the blessing of God than cooperating with his desired will. No other journey will take you to the place of ultimate satisfaction than cooperating with God's will his desired will, his commands for you. What is God saying to you that may be uncomfortable that you need to be honest about? The honesty comes out of awareness. Awareness is recognizing, you know what? Um, my drinking is a problem. Awareness, it's not God's will that I continue in an alcoholic lifestyle. Um, my sexuality is a problem. I'm, I'm being promiscuous. I'm being um, in an in a unhealthy relationship. Awareness of the problem, of the dissonance, of the troublesome nature of shifting from where you are to where God wants you to be is the start. And then honesty, get honest about that. Mary by no means was in an inappropriate relationship. In fact, she was in an absolutely appropriate relationship. But she still was troubled by this idea of being pregnant and having to probably answer to everyone around her, how did you get pregnant, right? And nobody's gonna believe, uh, from God? <laughs> that's, not gonna, that's not gonna sell. Uh, that's not gonna be swallowed easily by those around her. Mary's troubled about this. And she asks, um, very honestly, how can this be? Mary asks, since I'm a virgin. And then the angel tells her, he says, the Holy Spirit's gonna come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And so the Holy One who was born um, to be called the Son of the Most High, um, even Elizabeth, and I love I love the angel. The angel um, brings in Elizabeth as an example to Mary of another move of God, the will of God, that's impossible. 
that's you know this is that that takes honesty and takes humility this and so he elizabeth even your cousin elizabeth is going to have a child in her old age and she who is said to be unable to conceive is now in her sixth month for nothing is impossible with god you see whenever we're honest about our struggles we we come to terms with the fact that what god wants is something that is so far away from what i perceive is possible Everyone who's been used by God mightily had this juxtaposition, had this kind of polarizing thing that I can't, I can't do that. Mary had to come to terms with, I can't do that. I can't understand how I could be pregnant without having sex with a man. I can understand that. Every person in scripture who was used mightily by God had something they deemed as impossible, can't work. Here's what has to happen. You and I, as we learn to accept, remember I said three words, awareness, acceptance, obedience. Um, <laughs> love that dog behind me, gotta love the neighbor dog. Um, I wanna give you some examples through scripture. Abraham was old. Abraham didn't think Sarah could have a child. Sarah didn't think she could have a child. When the idea, a notion came up that God was going to help her get pregnant, God was going to, not, not like the same way he helped Mary, but the same way he helped Elizabeth, God was going to, God was going to produce in Abraham's seed potency and in Mary's egg fertilization, and they were going to have a child. Sarah laughed. Ha <laughs> ha, can't be. She thought, why? Because she thought it was impossible. Elijah was suicidal. He didn't, he was, he was fearful of his life and death, and he was he contemplated even the worth of his own life. He was suicidal. Joseph was abused. Uh, Job was bankrupt. Moses had a speech impediment. Gideon was afraid. Samson was a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. The Samaritan woman was divorced. Noah was a drunk. Jeremiah was young. Jacob was a cheater. David was an adulterer and a murderer. Um, Noah, Jonah was, ran from God. Naomi was a widow. Martha was a worry ward. Peter denied Christ three times. And Zachariah was, Zacchaeus was small and was, uh, uh, was money hungry. And Paul was a Pharisee and persecuting and killing Christians. Every one of them had something, something that was what could have been a barrier that they had to become honest about. Paul had to face the face with honesty. He was persecuting the church and persecuting the Messiah. Peter had to get honest that he was that he was denying Christ, even though he promised he would never do so. You see, for us to to step into God's will, to join his story. We need awareness that there may be some troublesome things we'll have to address. Honest about where we are and what has to change for us to follow God and join him in his will. Um, we do this whenever we begin uh, to trust God. Um, his will has everything to do with facing our weaknesses and our objections. God's will has everything to do with facing our weaknesses and our objections. All those great figures throughout Scripture had to do it. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 12, the Apostle Paul said it like this. But he said to me, the Apostle Paul, receiving a message from God, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. The Apostle Paul, we may not see his weakness, but he understood his personal weaknesses. And he understood that he had to get honest about those weaknesses. He had to get honest about his objections, that he couldn't be used by God. Peter had to get honest about his denial, that it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't stop him from being a recipient of God's forgiveness and being used by God. God wants you and I to get honest about whatever it is in our lives that we say is an obstacle, is a barrier for me to cooperate with and join in God's will and God's plan and God's purposes because God's best are still in front of you. God's best are still in front of you.
and he wants you to accept that. Number three, lastly, adjusting to God's will through obedience. What we see in Mary is when she says in verse 38, I am the Lord's servant. That's an adjustment. That's moving from a place where Mary was, was probably very, very interested in, in the marriage that she was going to have with Joseph and serving her plans and going her direction. And all of a sudden, at the risk of possibly her marriage, her, her proposal, uh, the, the, the being betrothed or engaged to Joseph could have dissolved right before her eyes. What if Joseph doesn't go for this? Mary had a lot of things to consider in her honesty and in her awareness, in her acceptance. And Mary chose before Joseph makes a choice about what he's going to do with the situation. Mary made a choice and her choice was, I will be your servant. What is Mary doing? Mary is adjusting to God's will through obedience. That's what he calls all of us to do. Every one of us, every one of us, when it comes to our will or his will, have to decide to adjust our will to his. Today and in this season, I'm asking you to, to consider what you might be able to do to adjust your will to God's. Is it about the way you treat others in this season? Are, are you getting a little cantankerous in this season? Are you, uh, are, are you critical of those that either wear masks or don't wear masks? Are, are you critical of, of people instead of being compassionate? That, that everyone right now is kind of, they're, they're at the very fringe of their emotions, some people are. Some are hardly able to to feed their families and others are are experiencing a bounty um, I mean, there's so much going on what's going on for you in this season how might God want you to adjust have you let your faith kind of get pushed to the back burner to to, to not be engaged in, in in daily disciplines and the pursuit of God um, have you been uh, maybe falling back into an obsessive behavior or compulsive behavior with sex or alcohol or drugs or shopping or what's been taking place in your will and what you want to do where God might be saying, this might feel troublesome, but I need you to be aware you're not in my will. I need you to be honest about how challenging this is and I need you to obey, to adjust for obedience. Adjust to say, God, I need to reorganize my steps. I need to re reorder my steps to follow you, Lord Jesus. Today, I want us to, to recognize that as we come to the Christmas holiday, oh, let us, let us celebrate the birth of Christ. Let us not be timid, but let us be bold. Let us understand that in a changing world, Jesus has not changed. His calling in our church has not changed. All of us are going to go through COVID. All of us are going to go through this season. But I want you to know, you don't have to go through it. You can grow through it. You can grow through this season if you step into God's will, His desired will for you, to start giving thanks. I give thanks. I try to give thanks every day. I do it uh, often. I try to do it every day to give thanks for COVID to give thanks for the challenges of this season, to give thanks for the difficulty of navigating, communicating online and, and doing outdoor services and indoor services. Why? Because the church needs to be flexible with our culture, flexible with obeying the authorities. God calls us to do that. He calls us to obey the authorities over us. That's not wishy-washy. That's not flip-flopping. That's flexibility. The church should be the most flexible organization on the planet, but we should never be unfocused on the mission that matters the most. What matters most is God's redemptive plan, God's sovereign will to be accomplished as you and I respond to his desired will and we step in with obedience to love our enemies, with obedience to take care of the poor, with obedience to care for those who are struggling, with obedience to, to do good deeds, with obedience to stimulate one another to growth, with obedience to not forsake meeting together. God wants you and I to cooperate with his desired will. Today, right now, would you just agree with me? Agree with me that you do not want to stay where you are. Agree with me that you do not want to bend your will to only do your agenda. 
but you want your will to be bent to do his. Lord Jesus, we recognize right now that your will is before us, your plans and purposes. And God, rather than go our way, we want to choose to go your way. God, rather than do our will, we would say with Jesus, your will be done. Lord, help us to uh, embrace your sovereign will of redemption coming to earth, redeeming all things. God, we embrace your desired will to join you in that pursuit, to seek you daily, to join with others in community and faith, to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Jesus, we choose to join the will of God. We ask your blessing on our obedience. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll see you this week in our devotions. God bless you. May this Christmas season be filled with good things for you. In Christ's name, amen. Goodbye. I want to thank you for all of your faithful giving and support over the years. It's because of your giving, we're able to meet you where you are and love you to where Christ wants you to be. During these times, we want to continue to be faithful. So I just want to remind you of all the different ways you can give. First, by going to yc.church and clicking the Give tab. Second, by texting YCGIVE to 77977. And lastly, with the YC app. The office is open by appointment now, so you can call us at 209-383-5038 to make an appointment to meet with someone here on campus. Have a great day and God bless.